I'll use this one. <laughs> if you don't know, prior to this, I used to say those words a lot. Check one, two, uh-huh. And I used to make a range of different sounds that I'm not going to make this morning because it's helpful for um, miking stuff. But good morning, church. It's gl I'm glad that you're able to be here this morning. I'm excited to be here this morning because isn't it amazing to gather as God's people to hear from his word and I'm sure, it's already up there, I'm sure that you'll all be aware that we're going through our Acts series in the morning service. And so this morning we're going to continue on with that. But before we do, I just want to bring to the surface something that has been underlying our journey so far. Right? It's something prevalent throughout all of Acts. It's something which we need to address. And that is that contextually there is a large separation, there's a large cultural division occurring in what we're reading. And what does that mean? It means that when Acts was written in the period that we're talking about, there's this cultural division between Jews, who are God's chosen people, God's holy people, and Gentiles, who are unholy, ceremonially unclean. There's this division, there's this divide culturally whereby the Jews have been given God's law. They're living under Jewish law, which controls what they eat, how they do, what they, how they act. And then you've got the Gentiles who aren't living under this law. They're, they're doing their own thing. And so there's this mentality whereby the Jews are God's people. And that's still true today. The Jews are God's people. And the Gentiles, well, they're just everyone else. And this, separate, this separation, this divide was so huge that it was unlawful for Jewish people to go into the house of Gentiles, to spend time with them, to eat with them, to do this. This is the divide which we're talking about. And although it's not perfect, I want to draw a slight parallel for us today because I don't know whether you're like me. I've never once woken up and gone, man... The Jewish-Gentile divide is just really prevalent today. I, I've never had that thought come through my mind. But as I was reflecting on this, and as I said, it's, it's not a perfect parallel, but I want you to ponder the parallel that if the Jews were God's holy chosen people, right, and the Gentiles were the unholy, the unclean, not God's people, then today too we can kind of find ourselves in just as big a cultural separation, a cultural difference whereby we consider ourselves Christians, God's holy chosen people, and non-Christians who are still sinful, still unholy, still all of that. And I just want you to ponder these thoughts as we continue through Acts 10 because the parallel works. And so if you've got your Bibles there, please do turn to Acts 10. But before we read, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the instruction which you give us through it. And Lord, we pray now that as we read through your word, as we unpack these ideas, Lord, would you be speaking to each of us individually? Would you be speaking to our hearts, Lord God, and showing us how we're to respond to you this morning? We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts 10, we get to look at the character of, of Peter, right? And Peter's not a new character in the Bible. We've been flicking through Acts. There's been quite a few Christian people that were looking at doing amazing things. But this is the same Peter, Simon Peter, that was a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? The same Peter who did ministry with Jesus, the same Peter who saw Christ hanging on a cross for the sins of humanity, who saw Christ resurrected from the dead, who was there, he heard firsthand the instructions of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. The same instructions that as Christians here this morning, we have from Jesus. Peter heard the instructions, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And we see that Peter, he's been doing this, right? He's been going out, he's been traveling from town to town, preaching the gospel, right? He's been going through, led by the Holy Spirit, filled by the Holy Spirit. He's been led to perform miraculous healings. But at every step of the way, he gives the glory to God. He says, it's Jesus Christ who heals you. It's, it's Peter presenting the gospel. 
And we see at the tail end of chapter 9, two very distinct stories of Peter obediently living out this commandment. And everyone who saw what he had done, everyone who heard the gospel that he was preaching, put their faith in the Lord and were saved. And so it's out of this context that we come to chapter 10 this morning. Verses 1 to 8 says this. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. And so what's going on here? Remember this divide, which I said, we've got Jews and we've got Gentiles. Well, Cornelius, he falls into the Gentile category, right? We're told that he was an official of the Roman army, keeping in mind that this is the same Roman army that was oppressing the Jews. And so at a first glance, he wouldn't have been very popular amongst the Jewish people, right? He was high up in the Roman army. And yet there's something different about Cornelius. God is at work in Cornelius's life because we're also told that he was a God-fearer. While he was a Gentile, he was a God-fearer. What does that mean? It means that Cornelius was sympathetic and supportive of the Jewish faith. So while he didn't fall under, while he didn't adhere to the customs, the laws, the practices of the Jewish people, so he couldn't be counted as a Jew, He was sympathetic. He gave generously to those who needed it. He prayed continually, we're told. God was at work in his life. And it's during one of these prayer times that through a vision, God sends an angel and says, Cornelius, you need to go and get Peter. This is exactly where he is. They didn't have tracking back then. God just knew. And then we get the flip side of Cornelius is being told to go get this Peter fella, right? And Peter, disciple of Jesus, very much a Jew, right? Had grown up from birth under the Jewish law, was a part of God's holy chosen people, knew how to stay under the law to make sure that he was clean, to perform ceremonies, to be a part of what he needed to do. And yet we see that through the description of where Peter is, that God's also working in Peter's life, right? We're told that he's with a Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea, and we might read that and go, wow, Peter's doing it rough. He's got sea views. But there's a little bit more in it than that. See, Peter was staying with a tanner. By very definition of his job, working with dead animal skins, working with leather, that made Simon the Tanner unclean. His house was by the sea because he wasn't allowed to be in the city. And so we see that God is at work in Peter's life, making him less concerned about Jewish traditions and ceremonial notions. See, Peter isn't just passing by. He stays with an unclean Jew. He, He stays there making himself unclean. And so we see that both Jew and Gentile God is at work. And I just want you to take that parallel which I pulled forward earlier, Christian and non-Christian. We can stand here this morning. We've already declared how good God is, right? We can see that God is at work in our lives. And that's fantastic. But I want to remind us all that there was a point in our lives where we weren't saved. There was a point in our lives where we hadn't made that decision to make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And yet, When you think back to that, even in hindsight, you can see that God was at work in your life. And so if that's true for us, then surely it has to be true that God isn't restricted to only being at work in Christian lives, but God is at work both in our lives and in the lives of non-Christians. 
And we continue on, we read verses 9 to 16. We get a glimpse into what was happening for Peter. And it says this, The next day, as they were on the way, the people that Cornelius sent, on, on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I would be confused, I would be amazed, I wouldn't know how to process what I'm feeling. And we're told here that Peter is just going to get a snack, right? He's going to get food, and all of a sudden, he falls into a trance. God pulls down a blanket from heaven with all different types of animals on it, remembering that under Jewish law, there were clean and unclean animals for Peter to eat. And so when God says, kill and eat, Peter gives a very normal response, right? He he gives the response we can expect him to give. He says, surely not. He says, Lord, I've never eaten anything that is common. I've never eaten anything that is unclean. That seems normal, right? Because he's living under Jewish law, the law which God gave that, hey, these are the animals you can and can't eat. Peter's response is normal, and yet God says, do not call common what God has made clean. He says these words, and it's no wonder that I'll summarize the the next couple of verses. It's no wonder that Peter's perplexed by this, right? Everything that he's known from a child has just been changed all of a sudden. God says, what I've called clean, don't call common. And so we see Peter's confused. God has emphasized this, not once, not twice, but three times. That kind of shows us that it was important for Peter to understand. And so he's there wrestling with it. He didn't just go, that's confusing. I'll leave that until I figure it out. We're told that Peter was pondering this vision. He was pondering what it was that God was telling him through this. And as he's doing this, as he's in this process of pondering, the Spirit comes to him again and says, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And so here's here's Peter. He goes down, he goes to the gate. At this time, the two servants and the one guard sent from Cornelius, all Gentiles, rock up at the gate. And Peter says these words. He says, I'm the one you are looking for. What is your reason for coming? Because, you see, Peter would have walked up to them and immediately gone, hey, these guys are Gentiles. There's that divide. He's going, these guys are Gentiles. I'm not supposed to be doing much with them. And yet he knows that the Spirit said, go and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And so Peter, grasping this, grasping that he needs to be obedient to the Spirit, invites them in. They they stay there the night and then they go off. Peter journeys with them to Cornelius. I've talked about this divide. And... The, the reason that I bring this up is because, see, what's happening here is Peter is relating with Gentiles, right? He's relating with them. He's inviting them into the place where he's staying. He's willingly going to their home to be with them. And as I'm thinking about this, I started to ponder, well, if Jew and Gentile, Christian and non-Christian, how often do we go in? and meet with non-Christians. See, I think that there's a danger where we can fall into the thinking that Christ is for Christians, 
that statement rolls off the tongue. It kind of sounds true. Christ is for Christians. We're here this morning, most of us Christians, if you're not somewhat open to it. And so we go, yeah, at church, I'll, I'll happily tell you about my faith. I'll happily talk about what God's doing in my life. But on Monday, I'm kind of going to disassociate that a little bit. See, the, these people that I work with or these people in the street, they, they don't necessarily want to hear about Christ because if they did, they'd come to church. They, they don't necessarily want to hear this because Christ is for Christians. But the reality is that that statement is deeply flawed. We can't be thinking like that, church. We, we read in verses... Sorry. 23... 23 and 24. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. See, Cornelius, who had been led by the Spirit to go and get Peter, had then not, not just gone, well, hopefully he comes, right? God was doing a work in his heart because he went and gathered all his family and friends and said, no, Peter's coming. We've sent him we don't know whether that location is verified, but we, we've sent him. Peter is coming. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell face down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. This is radical, right? Because Jew and Gentile, there's that division there. There's God's chosen people and the unclean people. And yet Peter is starting to grasp this idea that God is laying on his heart. He pulls Cornelius up, recognizing his own sin, and goes, I too am a man. Do not worship me. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many people gathered. And Peter said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Peter's grasping the vision. He's grasping that he cannot be doing this. And church, for us today, are we guilty of separating as Christians and declaring Christ as Christians, but not necessarily to the non-Christians? Are we guilty of pulling away, of not breaching that gap? So when I was sent for, this is Peter speaking. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. And I asked them, why you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon at Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Remember, Jesus commanded Peter and the disciples to go out to preach the gospel, to baptize people, and to teach them everything that Jesus had commanded them to do. That's the same call that us as Christians today have. It's to go out and to do that. Not only to Christians, they've already got the good news. But to all those non-Christians, the people that we can sometimes find it difficult to have a conversation with, the people that we can sometimes steer away from. Just like Peter and Cornelius, God's working in both sides. And so we see Peter doing this. We see that he's being obedient. He's starting to grasp this. But it's in verse 34 that he declares it so articulately. He says it so profoundly. He says, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Peter's understood that Christ didn't just die for the Jews. They're still God's chosen people, but Christ 
didn't just die for the Jews. And so he says this statement, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And Peter goes on. He gives an account of what Jesus did in his life. He gives an account of Jesus' ministry. He preaches the gospel. He says, you already know this, but let me tell you of who this Jesus person is. And he finishes off this in verse 42 and 43. He says, and he, being Jesus, the one he's talking about, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. To him who believes and receives him, everyone who receives him and believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And we're told that even as Peter was speaking these words, this Gentile group of people, these historically unclean, forgotten about people, received what Peter was saying. They understood it. They went, you know what? Jesus is Lord. They put their faith in Christ. They believed in him. They received forgiveness of their sins through Christ's name. They believed and were saved. And it wasn't just a statement that they made, but while Peter was saying these things, this inward change had happened, this decision had been made, and Peter saw in verses 44 through to 48, Peter saw the Holy Spirit fall on this Gentile people. The Holy Spirit filled them so that they were talking in tongues, just like the Holy Spirit had fallen on the disciples and the Jews gathered The Holy Spirit fell on them. They were saved. And Peter says, who can withhold water for baptizing these people? See, Jesus' commandment was to teach, to preach the gospel, to make disciples and to baptize them. And Peter, having seen this, despite the historical cultural divide between the Jews and the Gentiles, he had seen that salvation had come. He had seen that Christ was working in their lives. And so not only were they saved, they were baptized and they too were disciples to go and do the very thing that Peter had gone to do. And so church, what, what can we take away from this? Why, why is this important? Why is this thing where we don't really think about or talk about Jews and Gentiles in our everyday lives? Why is this important? Well, if we make that parallel between Christians and non-Christians... It puts an emphasis on Jesus' command to us. He says, Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. See, we've gathered here this morning, we've declared in worship and praise the goodness of our faith. We've declared the goodness of Jesus Christ for the salvation which we have. And each of us here can acknowledge, I hope, that God is working within us. God is growing us, he's teaching us, and yet also he's commanding us, he's calling us to go out and make disciples. It's hard to, to preach the gospel to other Christians. They already have that faith. And so we're called to go out beyond the church. We're called to not only have Christian conversations on a Sunday, but on a Monday through to Saturday as well. We see that God, just like he was at work in Peter, is at work in you and I. But we also see through Cornelius that God is at work in non-Christians. He's at work just like Cornelius was a Gentile. He's at work in non-Christians. Just like before we were saved, God was at work in our lives. God too is at work in the people that we might try to avoid because they're a little bit rough around the edges. And we're called to go and to preach the gospel to them, to get beside them, to disciple them. And church, if you take but one thing away from this morning, let it be this statement that Peter makes. 
Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. I said before that we can fall into the thinking that Christ is for Christians. And so if people believe in God, then we'll tell them about Christ. But if they don't, well, they don't really want to hear it. Otherwise, they'll ask. That's not the case. You see, Christ isn't for Christians. Christ is for everyone. Christ didn't just die for Christians. Christ died for everyone. He died for the sins of the whole world. Salvation is for Christians. And so we're called to go out. We're called as disciples to go out to share the good news. Because God's not only working in us, he's working in others as well. We're called to go out, to preach the gospel so that those who God's working in might be able to have faith, might be able to come to this point where everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Christ isn't for Christians. Christ is for everyone. But salvation is for Christians. God is at work. Will we be like Peter and go out? even to the people who are undesirable for us to talk to, who we don't necessarily want to be in contact with, will we go out in faith and share the good news? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the salvation which we have in you. Lord, we thank you that it's not by our own efforts but through Christ and the sacrifice that he made, that we're able to stand here this morning as your people and declare that we are saved. Lord, that we can have relationship with you through Christ. And yet, Lord, we know that there was a time before we made that decision. And Lord, we know that just as you are at work in our lives now, you were at work in our lives then. Lord, and that you used people along the way to bring the gospel to us. Lord, that you brought understanding through the words which they used. And Father God, I just pray that this morning that you would lead us and guide us. Would you place on our hearts those who you want us to share the gospel with. Lord, would you help us to overcome any division that we have, any selection that we have about who we will tell the good news to. Father God, would you lead us and guide us in this? I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing this last song, but let me just read these words to you. Freely you gave it all for us. You've surrendered your life upon the cross. Great is the love poured out for all. That's everyone. This is our God. Servant and King, you rescued the world. This is our God. Please join. Please stand.
there may be someone here today that um, just has been touched by Dylan's message about there is no favouritism, God loves us all. And if you need to talk through that, all of our pastors are here this morning and they can um, just draw you closer to God. So just go and um, see them this morning if you're needing that. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the God who created everyone and you are the God who loves everybody. So dear Lord, as we go this week, may we remember that each person that we come across is loved by you. May we look at them through the eyes of Jesus. May we witness to them and may we show them the love of who God is. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Please join us for tea and coffee.